There is no place in this book, unless you're reading out of context, where God says, I'm going to save everybody. Now, God desires that none should perish, but not all will be saved. And that ties into the doctrine of election. As a part of the series that we've been in on the emergence and development of Judaism in antiquity, we have traversed sort of uh, what has for sure become clear for many, but it's still very muddled, very conflated, and very confusing. Even, uh, you know, every week that I'm pulling books off the shelf or I'm researching, I'm finding new evidence of even the old-time scholars getting this all muddled because it is confusing. Um, what we're doing today is kind of moving along in Romans where we were last week, but I, I need to say something so that people can understand. This portion of what we're doing from last week, this week, and probably for the next two or three weeks has heavy theological implications, and I'm not going to talk a lot of theological jargon to you, but it has heavy implications, today's message especially. And the difficulty with this, I tried to break this down to make this a little bit uh, more comprehensible, but we are going to encounter things in Romans that people will have a tough time with. Now, part of I've said this to you before, part of when we're studying the Bible, old or new, we will encounter things that are difficult. And sometimes we, our minds just say, that, 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 that's just too difficult, that's just too hard for me. So I'm going to give you some advice and you do with it what you want. There are plenty of things in this book that are difficult, not simply to understand, but difficult in terms of human perception. So you cannot approach those things that you have an issue with, with your mind. God's ways are not our ways. You've got to approach this as God knows what he's doing. And we're not God, thank God. So the things that are given to us that if they are difficult, I'd say you must try and consider that God didn't give all of this to us so that it could all fit like a neat little jigsaw puzzle. It doesn't. And that's the beauty. We, we are to work certain things out. Let me ask you a question. For those, maybe you'll remember when you first started reading the Bible. So I'm just going to be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 60 years. When you first started reading, yeah, did you encounter things that you just went, I, I, just, I don't get it, it doesn't make sense, I, I, no. Yeah, okay. So that's really kind of progressive revelation by the Holy Spirit to continually help us to grow and push those barriers where we, we just, mm, we have resistance. So we, we will be addressing this uh, situation today. But let me go back a little bit as I touched on, not last week's message, but the week before. It is important to point out that when Christ walked the earth, yes, the people that he was supposed to go to, he came to his own and his own received him not, they rejected him for the most part. But we also have to look clearly to see that they're probably the bulk of his followers were Jewish, and then later some of, we'll call them the most prominent people, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and of course the Apostle Paul um, make this about face to follow him. And we have, obviously, Paul we have great evidence for, and there are probably many others. Uh, but what's important is we're looking at, through that lens, two messages ago and onwards, why did the Jews reject him? And that's an extremely important question to ask, not with immaturity or with prejudice. It's an important question to ask because if you think about it, the time of Christ, there was no New Testament yet. There's only the Old Testament. And in this case, it's fairly clear that people were hearing the word. You get to be very familiar with the word. The average person would know 
some, uh, if not a lot of scripture, just by memorization. But then you've also got the Pharisees, the scribes, those people who were versed, who actually spent their life studying this book. So it becomes a mystery to me. How is it possible that these people would be so well-versed in their, their own writing and miss it? How? And you say, well, that's right there. That's, don't, don't start answering. Don't think you know the answer. Because it's not until you get in to read what Paul writes that we can only begin to understand what God has done and why he did it. Now, back there in the Old Testament, God, I believe through Isaiah, says he's going to basically make so they can't see, they can't hear, they can't receive, so they won't be healed. They won't be able to understand. That may be one component of it, but the most important thing that happens in Romans is Paul, who has great understanding of Judaism, he was, of course, a Jew, could explain as he was called to minister to the Gentiles, but I would say it's a spattering, okay? Even though he's called to the Gentiles, I'm sure Jews listened to him too, to be able to see it from his perspective and understanding where the Holy Spirit helped him to communicate something that if we're not clear we form all kinds of crazy ideas about why these people rejected back then and why they still reject today. This is what we're going to look at today to figure out why. So if you will turn in your Bibles to Romans 9, that was my introduction. And we started off last week by looking at Paul's appeal, his what's going on inside of him the heaviness and the sorrow he has for his kinsmen, and begins to point out something, and the argument, if you will, or his polemical, the way he goes about it, he builds this up in such a way to explain, and it's sifted down into a very simple concept. I'll just say it like this from um, the beginning of, say, verse 4 of Romans 9, all the way through till... Um, Verse 13, what he's talking about, and I've still found that many Christians aren't clear on this, so I'm going to take a second. If you know what I'm talking about, you're like, wow, how could people not understand this? Child of promise versus child of the flesh. And this whole concept here is having to do, I'll put it in the sim most simplistic way, God, even though he gave the law, and he gave all of these things in the old. God has not changed his promises. God himself has not changed. So when we look at child of promise and child of the flesh, and the reference there obviously is uh, Isaac, who is the child of promise, and Ishmael, who is the child of flesh. I'll simplify this. You can either operate and take God at his word and operate by faith. And you say, well, God said it, and that's that. Or you can take the other position, which is, yes, God said it, and I also have things I must do, and you add to it. That's called works. So faith versus works. Now, the Bible repeatedly, and this is why I said to you, if you're not interested in learning, you will have some very bad theology. Show me a person who wants to talk to you about James, and I'll show you a person who has not studied the rest of the book. You like that? Because James is the only person who could tell you that works must accompany faith, and honestly, over and over and over and over and over, the book says the just shall live by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. So, it's important to understand what we're dealing with. So when we say child of promise, I re referenced Isaac because God spoke to these elderly people and said, I'm going to give you a child, not 
in a mysterious way as in the birth of Christ, but I'm going to give you a child. You are barren, elderly, but next time, this time next year, I'm going to come back and visit you. You'll be with child. Now, that's right there a promise. God says, I'm telling you what's going to happen. The key thing is, to, did God make good on his promise? Yes, she gave birth to a child named Isaac. And the statistical probability in our universe of that happening, not because he was elderly, but because she was barren and elderly, is probably slim and none. So miraculous in its own right, all right? But nevertheless, God said, I will do this for you. This I am telling you this promise that was given back there to Abraham and passed on. This will happen. And it gets passed down generation after generation through a specific line. On the flip side, you'll have people that will read the Bible. And when they come to this passage, they'll say, child of the flesh, I don't understand. Well, that was Ishmael. Instead of waiting on God's promise to be fulfilled, they took matters into their own hands. Sarai gave her handmaid Hagar. Abraham beds Hagar, and they produce a son which God did not promise. God did not promise that that way. So that's what that means, living by faith, acting in faith, taking God at his word versus, well, I, I, God might be late, so I'll do it myself, and I'll give him the credit. No, it's not the way it works. So just so we're clear on that, because I know repeatedly I'm seeing people are not necessarily understanding this. Hopefully that makes it plain. So what we are going to look at here are verses. I'm actually going to touch a little bit on Jacob and Esau again, because that will help make the point. But we're actually going to be looking today at verses 15 onward. And a concept that now comes into play that... I need to address, which is the topic of election. So I'm going to say it like this. God alone has the right to choose. He has the right to choose who he's going to save and who he's not going to save. Now, you know, for people to say, Pastor, can you give us a, you know, an idea of your theology? Well, just listen, and you'll understand what my theology is. It comes out of this book. There is no place in this book, unless you're reading out of context, where God says, I'm going to save everybody. Now, God desires that none should perish, but not all will be saved. And that ties into the doctrine of election. That's number one. Now, there have been people that have taught, including genius contributors into this domain, such as Karl Barth, he had a very, a little bit of a twist on his understanding, which kind of leaned into universalism. Everyone will be saved eventually. Now, listen, the Bible says clearly, God says, all souls are mine. Take that and take the concept, if God was speaking, all souls are mine and I have the right to do with those souls what I wish. Well, that's not fair. Sorry, that's the way God does it. So, election. For the old timers here, this is crystal clear, but for some of the new folks, not so much. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says that God chose out of the world. The Greek word is exelexito. That word basically is that God chose some out of the world, but not all. He chose some, and they are called chosen, if you will. So that is the doctrine of election. Not everybody is chosen. Once you get to understand that, it begins to make sense about why and how God chose Jacob over Esau. It's God's prerogative. Now, don't get confused. Election and predestination are not the same thing. And I'm not even wanting to get into predestination right now. That's it's another subject that can take us on far, 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 and long, long, long diatribes of things not interested in. But election, this is God's choice, and it's not based on deeds, but based solely on God's sovereign grace. So when we talk about this concept, 
And we're looking at it here. God chose, for example, Abraham. Out of a sea of people, he chose to talk to him. Not anybody else in his family chose to talk to him. And then God chose that the promise would be given in Isaac. So all of these tie into some form of election. Right down to you all who are sitting in the sound of my voice. It's kind of, if you really, really think carefully, and don't discount because what I'm saying is so simplistic, it's kind of mind-boggling that you're sitting here while there is a whole slew of people out there that are watching their football games, they're disinterested, they don't care, oh, religion's stupid, God doesn't exist, okay? The concept of election, that God even opened your eyes, that's what we're talking about. And, and why, for example, I've, you hear me say this all the time, I don't know why he chose me. I have no clue, but I'm grateful because I do have the understanding that God could have opted to not choose me. And you might ask, well, when does this choosing happen? Well, the Bible says that he speaks our name. He spoke our name before the worlds were formed. And that, that's, that ties into that other doctrine I said I can't get into today. So why I want us to look at this carefully is because the doctrine of election is also going to touch on who can be saved. And that's God's prerogative. So there are people in the modern universe, today's world, that cannot make these two things come together. If our Jewish brothers and sisters rejected Christ 2,000 years ago, and they're still rejecting Christ, how is it possible? How will they be saved? How will this work? So Paul brilliantly explains, and this is, it begins to be clear that, as I said, in the day when Christ returns, this is why there's plenty of writing in the Old Testament. I think it will be so crystal clear to those people who God has chosen to be able to see that when he, when he appears, there will be no confusion. There will be no, oh, let me, let me think about this for a minute. They will know. Well, what about the people who died having rejected Christ? Well, you remember it says when Jesus died... On the cross, he went down and he preached to the departed souls. And I take that to be people who are memorialized in this book, Abraham, Isaac, the patriarchs, all of the prominent people who feed, those people who trusted God, probably went down and preached to them and said, you all died not having obtained the promise. That's me, Christ. But I'm here to tell you, God made good. And on the final day, when there is the resurrection of the dead, which really should be understood as the resurrection of souls, God will choose and separate out even there. There will be a culling. Not everyone will go to the white throne judgment seat and not everyone. So two different places of judgment, not the same. And there are so many references, even in the Gospels, that explain the difference that God will do in sorting out people. So we can't say, oh, well, these people won't be saved. That's actually a very silly thought. But not all those people will be saved. I'm going to say a mouthful now because I like to make enemies. Not all Christians will be saved. Did you, did you just say that? Yeah, I did. Lord, Lord, didn't we do thus and so in your name? Depart from me. I never knew you. So there'll be a big shock. And that's why I said it's important for those who are listening to me. You may not be, uh, you, you may think, well, I'm not an academic mind. and You don't have to be. Just be sincere and committed. That's all God's asking. Trust him. Take him at his word. That's all God's asking. So when we understand that God, it is God's prerogative, um, then you come back and, as I said, revisit the phrase. And it's very important to look at this. Uh, he's talking about Jacob and Esau and says, For the children not being born, verse 11, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. 
So even regarding Jacob and Esau. Now think about the character of Jacob for a second. And this will clarify something else. People say, well, if you're one of those people, you must be really good, right? Wrong. Jacob was a conniver, heel catcher, deceiver, and that's what God chose. You might say, well, that's not fair. Then you look at Esau, and the Bible warns us, be not like that profane person Esau, not discerning spiritual things. So the thing that Jacob had could have been all that, but there was, there was a spiritual receiver there. That's why he could lay his head down at that place and say, surely God was here and I knew it not. If the roles had been reversed and Esau had been there, he wouldn't have cared less. He wouldn't have even had the perception. So that's what we're talking about. Only God can see the heart. So when it says, they, neither one having done good or evil, I just talked about his character. Doesn't matter. God's not interested. When you get over that hump, you will quit thinking, no, I was indoctrinated with this, with a Catholic mindset. You've got to be good. And the speech, I'm basically a good person. No, you're not. Neither am I. Christ makes you inside good, if you want to use those terms, righteous, justified. There's nothing good about any of us. If you take Christ out of this clay container here, what you got is filth and the inability to see anything else except the self. Bottom line. So he says here, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Really, he preferred Jacob. There's very strong words, but he preferred Jacob. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Then he goes on to move to the case of talking about Moses. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Let's stop there for a second. This, what he's referencing, remember they're delivered out of Egypt by Moses, God's leading. God calls Moses up to the mount, and he's up there, and the people are getting impatient. Where's Moses? Well, we don't know where the fellow is. Well, Aaron, give us something to worship. Okay, give me all your gold. We'll make a, a what you may call it for you to worship, and they make the golden calf. Moses, on his way down, hears the noise. He sees it. He's outraged. And to tell you, I think it's kind of interesting. They were so impatient they would have worshipped anything. And I love what Moses does. He grinds up the thing and they, they get to eat gold dust soup. Delicious. But then something interesting happens. Moses prays to God. And he's praying for the people to be spared. This comes out of that. Turn with me. I'm going to show you something. It's kind of Interesting the way God does things. So in Exodus 32 is that golden calf incident. And in a nutshell, as I said, Moses was pretty PO'd that this had happened. Then he begins to plead with God and essentially is begging God. And in the 33rd chapter... Moses says, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein it shall be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight, it is not that thou goest with us. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Then the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And then he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show 
mercy. So kind of interesting that this takes place at this juncture. See, he's he just finished pleading with God for leniency for the people to forgive their sins. And then he says, show me thy glory. And I think that the, the idea behind this perhaps, whether that was for Moses to still know or for the people to see, whichever one it was, a display of God's power for a rebellious, disobedient, not listening people that perhaps if they saw this, they maybe would get a little better attitude or might you know, put them in check. And then God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. In other words, Moses, really great that you're praying and asking me this, but this is my call. And I will dispense what I see fit based on my understanding and knowledge. And this is why God did not let that first generation enter into the land. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. He chose. It was his sovereign way. This is what he went with. But to Moses, he showed mercy, at least until Moses did the last faux pas. And even then, he was merciful to him. But for the sake of this, the context of this, it's important to see that all of this is putting into the pot part of the argument that Paul is building up to say for, one, all Israel, that comprises of the 12 tribes, and then specifically right down to the Jew, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It is God, my prerogative to choose whom I will save. This is why we will study this, and you'll find that Paul gives a warning, and he says, careful, all of you, not to be so quick to rush to judgment about who you think is going to make it in. And he gives that warning. And I, I really appreciate that because it's very easy to get caught up in, well, how dare they do this, right? So he goes on to say, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. What he's saying there, you can desire all you want. And when he says, nor of him that runneth, that is essentially another word for saying, works, flesh. You can try everything you want, but it is God who shows the mercy. Now, I've just finished quoting this scripture to you, and probably ad nauseum. Some of you are going to get it into your memory from me simply repeating it. But isn't this the same thing that John says when he says, but as many as received him to them, he gave them power to become sons of God, the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So there is a repeat there. And I've, I've said to you as a sidebar, you want sound doctrine? Look for God's repeatables. This is basically saying the same thing. Then he goes on to say something else which is quite interesting. He says, for even the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Don't you think that's odd? The scripture saith unto Pharaoh. And what Paul is saying, again, there's a lot of interesting, they're not quite Hebraisms, but it's, it's interesting the way he writes. What he's saying, if you go back to that passage, God was speaking directly to Moses, through Moses, to Pharaoh. So when he says, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, what he's saying basically without saying it is, God was speaking Kind of interesting. Even for the same purpose, I have raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will hardeneth. So there are two sides to the coin being presented here. The one side is to where God decides to show mercy. And please don't go down this pathway of thinking that you know who God will show mercy to. And the paradox, at the same time here we have Pharaoh, and if you reread the passages in Exodus several times that Moses appears before Pharaoh and Pharaoh's heart is hardened. It's progressive, as you will, it keeps going until 
It even says of Pharaoh that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, but really it was God's doing. So you've got two sides of the equation. You've got, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy, and I will harden the heart of whomever I will harden. That's a hard concept for us to accept because we, most of us have grown or been around people who are what I call the marshmallow Christians. You know, everything's good. There, there, there is no hardening. Listen, with God, all things are, in, are possible, but when God says that there are some that he will harden, don't even try to comprehend the fact that it wasn't just Pharaoh. You've got a whole... Look at society today. You've got people who are so hardened against God. Now, that's not to say, because I'm not God and neither are you, that God can't take a hardened heart and soften it and turn it to God, but that's his prerogative. That's his choice. So Paul is showing, we'll say, two different perspectives, and this becomes incredibly important because if we're not clear, this whole nine chapters, 9, 10, and 11, will not help us understand the why, what's going on, Israel's past, Israel's present, and Israel's future, and how that relates to us. See, what I'm against right now, and I'm going to try and say this without saying too much, but what I'm against right now is there is this tremendous amount of ignorance regarding Israel, modern Israel, ignorance regarding the Bible concerning Israel and the promises of God, and then this very confused group of people who don't understand um, if you're not reading the Bible, you, you will be on the other side of the street going, probably with another group of 20 or 30 or 100 nut jobs doing the same thing because you don't have the understanding. So all you can do is speak or think fleshly or be controlled by the devil. Just think about that because I just said a mouthful without saying anything. Wow. All right. Yeah. So let me show you something that might also make this become more clear. I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew 19. Now, if you have a Bible like mine, that's one, page 1,209. And as I said, sometimes the headers in my Bible are great, and sometimes they're kind of silly. Uh, if, we, if you start at verse 13, the header says, who will enter God's kingdom, which actually should be the header for the whole chapter, uh, right into chapter 20, if you're going to do that right, because it's all talking about God's kingdom. And he first talks about suffer, forbid not the children to come. And then we have the passage of the rich young man. And I want to point out something that you and I may have not looked at previously when we're talking about promise, which is faith versus flesh and works. Take a look at this. When the man came to Jesus, Master, what good thing shall I do? Just think about that for a minute. Even his question tells you he was coming from the frame of reference of, I must do something. Stop and think about that. I wish, I, I wish this, wasn't, this didn't sound so simplistic because most people cannot just say, I will take God's word and I will stand on it. No, I must do something. This is why altar calls are so popular. I must demonstrate, I must show, well, who are you demonstrating it to? The rest of the people, to the preacher? Do those people matter before God? No. What shall I do? And of course, we know that he had great possessions. He's very rich. And when he's told, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and follow me, he went away very sorrowful was not something that he was willing to do. My guess is if Jesus said, you know, I will give you some form of checking the box works, this guy would have been around. Because that, that was the conditioned mindset of the people, and it still is today. I must do something to be saved. 
except to exercise faith. I don't know and trust in Christ. I don't know what you could possibly be thinking if you're reading this book. Jesus says to his disciples that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed and said, Then who can be saved? Jesus beheld them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So consider the fact we cannot write off that this rich young man wasn't eventually touched by God. But in this particular setting, we know he went away. He was more concerned with the doing than the faithing, trusting Christ. So Peter says, Behold, we have forsaken all, followed thee. What shall we have? It's an interesting question from him. So, of course, Jesus tells him that you that have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. There's another mouthful right there. If you can even understand what he's saying, he, he never said here, you're going to be sitting there and judging the Jews. He said the twelve tribes. That means all the people that we've been talking about. This is why this takes you, if you really want to know, into Revelation. It's all tied together. And then the statement, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now that, that verse 30 actually probably belongs for some very bizarre reason to chapter 20. There was no chapter and verse. Um, but in any case, it should just flow 19 into 20. And the reason why I present this to you like this is because the, the topic is still who makes it in, and that's still God's prerogative. He could have done something to the young man's mind or his heart. It's God's choice. And God's not going to lasso people against their will either. Don't think that for a minute. But the statement, many, the many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first, start to become clear as we move into the concept of those that rejected and the newcomers, those who were not part of the old stock of Judaism, those that came late, those that came at the end. You go into chapter 20, and very interesting, because this actually paints the picture of what we need to pay attention to. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went about the third hour, saw others standing idle in the marketplace, said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And then likewise, the sixth and ninth hour, and then about the eleventh hour, he went out, found others standing idle, saying unto them, Why stand ye here all day idle? They send him, Because no man hath hired us. Saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that ye shall receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, give them their hire, beginning from the last under the first. And that's a big mouthful right there too. Because if you want to make that application where it says from the last, let's just say we are the last. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? We are the last? The last will receive their reward first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. And he answered of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree? Didn't you agree to work for a penny? Take what's yours and go your way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. It is not lawful for me to do. Is it, can I not do what I want? Right there, the statement, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Now he's talking about reward and hire. But again, it ties into God's sovereignty to do what he wants. And he doesn't have to ask. He doesn't need your approval. 
So this is what we're dealing with. And then he says, so the last shall be first and the first shall be last, for many are called, few are chosen. When you begin to put all this together, and if it really sinks in, you're going to have a reaction. It might happen later. Maybe you've already had it. For me, it, it never goes away. Puzzling that God would enter into my universe. I know that's a, it's, I'm trying to make the emphasis here. It's not mine, but in my mind. God would enter into my universe where I was to find me, to choose me, to call me. Now, it's not just me, it's any other person who is awake in Christ. So when you think about that, it's, it's radical. And then this concept here that is just put right out there. Don't think because these people here that God said, remember those people I said last week, stay there, I'll be back. They will not have the right, it's God's right, to complain about anything once they are awake, once their eyes are open. God makes sure to put this out as plain as day so there's no confusion here. And this is what I love about this book. If you're really studying it, you can see God is saying the same thing over and over again. Let's go back to Romans 9. So if you're putting these pieces together, remember I said to you, this is a little bit more theological. Not so much, you know, we've been dealing with a lot of different concepts. So again... If we're looking carefully, let's take a look here. So he says, verse 18, Therefore he hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And this is kind of the thing I've been saying. Some will react to this like a petulant child and say, that's, that's just not fair, that's just not right. Well, who are you? And that's what he goes on to say in verse 20. Who are you that repliest against God? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that thou repliest against God? Who are you to judge God? Who are you to even open your mouth? You want to keep going? No, I don't think so. All right. So you can see right here what we're dealing with. Now, when he says, Nay, O man, but who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel to honor and another to dishonor? Very clearly when he says, um, to make a vessel, formed and made. That is not suggesting, we're not talking about from your birth. The lump of clay is representative of fallen mankind. The lump of clay is just that, a lump of clay. And does God not have the prerogative to say, I'm going to take this and make it into whatever I choose? But you've got people who would reply against God and say, well, God, why didn't you take this lump and make me into a nice vase? Why didn't you make me into this? Or why didn't you make me into that? God's prerogative to do what he wants. And again, it says here, one to honor and one unto dishonor. So when people say, everybody's going to be saved. I remember that pastor down in uh, L.A., who basically, and thank God, the congregation basically said, we're not listening to any of this, and they, they all left. He was, he was the one saying, even the devil's going to be saved. Okay, well then, we should just throw out the book of Revelation, right? Because uh, it does say the devil, devil will be cast into the lake of fire, bound and then cast into the lake of fire. I, I don't know how you could be saved doing that, but okay, maybe there's a new method. My point is, <laughs> you know, listen, you never know in these days, right? Um... The point that Paul is making here is very, very important. Until we come to be able to approach this subject, there will be people saying, well, I don't see how God could, how could God possibly forgive these people over here? He said, 
I'm done with you now. I put all my efforts into you. I put all my heart into you. I gave you my words. I gave you my covenant. I gave you my promises. I gave you everything, including the promise of a Messiah, but you would not. So stay here. I'll be back. Those are the Jewish people. Turns his attention to the Gentiles and anyone else that would listen along the way, but the Gentiles specifically. And this is why it's really powerful that a converted Jew to Christianity is now preaching to new Christians. If you think about that, that was God's prerogative to take that man steeped in Judaism, turn him around, open his eyes so he could see Christ, and then he becomes this bold proclaimer of the faith. God's prerogative. This is why I said to you it's important that we pray for our loved ones who don't know the Lord. We pray for people who are turned off because we don't know. We are not God. We don't know what day or hour that God might honor your faith. There, there are, I mentioned this last week, but it bears mentioning again. There are husbands and wives in this church, one or the other, one that does not believe, the other that's here. And the contention that happens under the roof in your home must be perpetual. Why do you have to go? Why do you have to tithe? I mean, even putting the program on in your house could be very contentious. And I've said, pray for those people. Don't pray at them. Don't pray on them. Pray for them. God answers prayers. But then at the flip side of this, it's God's prerogative. It's kind of hard to believe. Why would God put someone in your life? You're, forgive me for this. You're all going to hate what I'm going to say. But imagine you're like tea bags. You've all been steeped. And all the essence of the tea has come out. Why would God put somebody in your life right beside you that cannot be infused or affected by what you hold in your heart is so precious. It's a mystery. Now, there'll be people who say, well, you've got to pick wisely. You've got to make sure that that person is, listen, I'm sorry, when you meet people, I don't think, you know, you can ask somebody if they believe. A lot of people say, oh, I believe, and you find out they really don't. Or I have faith, but you find out they have faith in other things, not in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then there are people who will lecture you and say, well, you've got, to, you've got to pick up out of a pool of people who you know are saved. Really? I don't think it works that way either. You know, pheromones, do you need that lesson? I'm not an expert on that, but pheromones don't necessarily distinguish between eeny, meeny, miny, and mo. okay? So, again, what do you do when you're in that predicament? And that's why I said you must Seek wisdom from the Lord. You must look to this book, look to what God says, and specifically trust that he chose you and loves you, that he wouldn't put you in this state in perpetuity. For you who are in that predicament, don't give up. And it's something that you should be talking to God about. Because God can enter in, and he does. But don't make... The error, as I said, that you can tell God what to do. Does the thing, shall the thing form, say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Now, I confess to you, I spent a lot of time talking to God and complaining about a lot. From probably 2000, right before 2000, my ordination, I told you this story before. Like, why, why, why? You know, like, like I'm telling you not to do, I did, right? <laughs> at least I'm honest about it. I'm not a hypocrite, okay? I spent a lot of time lamenting and asking God, why would you do this to me? I'm not qualified. I don't have what it takes. I'm not da 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 I, I'm sure if I could audibly hear God, God probably said, ah, shut up. <laughs> right? Eventually I did. <laughs> point I'm making to you, even just take a look at this ministry. The outcome of certain things could have been different. Plenty of people around God could have said, I want that one and not that one. So when God chooses, there's something to be said for all of us to look at this and don't say, oh, I'm 
I'm like the uh, person that says, well, I thank God I'm not like everybody else. No, thank God that God chose you, that you have the ability, you even have the desire to be interested in God's word. Do you know how many people I talk to every single week who they don't want to talk about God? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even go there, but they, they're not interested. Or if I should even slip up and say something biblical, it's almost like, oh, right? And what that does to me inside, it says to me, why? But that is God's prerogative and our frustration, perhaps, but then that requires extra faith. So let's be careful about something. When we understand what's underneath this all, and this is a very simple concept, back there in Romans 5, God basically, through the Spirit, tells the Apostle Paul something that we, if we look at, by one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. That means all of us should be condemned under God's wrath, not chosen, not called, not a. So if that's real to you, and see, this is, this is what separates people out. If that verse is real to you, then being called by God and being able to hear and being interested, even a little bit interested, should be as important and as big. See, because when I read this, I think to myself, I could have been in that pool of people that just go through life, you don't care about church, you don't care about the Bible, you don't care about God, you're not interested, you just go through life, it's like you have headphones on, you're enjoying the music, until the music stops, of course, but you don't know it will. So. This is why I say, all we like sheep, there is not one righteous. We are made worthy and righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. So then we come back to one simple question. Will Paul address the concept of what will become of these people? And the answer is yes. But he goes on to say, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So now you get the full picture. That's just the beginning dealing with the past. So no one here in the sound of my voice can say, well, God's completely done with them. No. In fact, it is needful. And I'll keep repeating this. It is needful from now until God says, this is the end, for there to be a remnant of practicing. We're not talking about Jew in name only, like Christians in name only, but of practicing Jews. There must be a remnant of it will be these people. See, if there's no remnant, if, if this all disappeared, there's scripture in here that cannot be fulfilled. And we're very clear about this. Everything in this book, God said, I spoke it. It is my word. It will not return void. I will make it come to pass. So there is plenty of evidence in this book that says not all the children of Israel and not all the children of Israel are Jews. So put all of that under the umbrella to say, God will sort this out. And if we're clear about this, what Paul says, whom he hath called, not, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. You've got to go back into that book. I'm not, if you don't know it, I'm not going to tell you. Go back into that book, Hosea, and read. It says, in the place where it was said unto them. Read where it was said. That will connect the dots, that there must be events. Even that is speaking of a future time, not in America, folks, okay, of where they will see where they will behold. It's even right there. So 
as we put these pieces together, you're going to see some interesting concepts that he keeps building, as I said, in the theological perspective that will paint the whole picture to let us understand why they rejected, why said, you're going to wait now, because there's places in the Bible that say, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, which it has not yet come to be completed. That, makes, that actually should give you and I some hope that there's some time left here, that the end of the world's not happening tomorrow. Couldn't anyway, because again, for prophetic reasons, there are a lot of things that have to come to pass. The bigger picture is this. God is in control, even though it doesn't seem like it, in matters small and big, in matters of concerning the people, as I said, addressing whether it is the people we call the Jews. I want you to think about, open this umbrella up a little bit bigger. There are people probably in your universe that you interface with on a daily or a weekly basis who do not identify as Christian and they don't identify as Jew. And they don't have anything, they don't know anything, they don't really care to know. Have you ever considered what of them? This is why Jesus also said, I have sheep, other sheep that are not of this fold. That's a big blanket to say God can turn around and say, Yep, that group over there, not that person over there, his prerogative. So until we get to that time, I suggest that we reserve and keep the mouth shut. We are not to judge. And specifically, can you imagine this? Imagine having lived your whole life, having read at least the Pentateuch in the day when Christ appears. Imagine that. Not as he came the first time where they rejected him, but the second time when those that God chooses to see, their eyes are open. I'm going to tell you, I envision, maybe it's a caricature, but I envision what that day is going to be like. And it's going to be a day of both great sorrow and weeping and also a day of great rejoicing. You know what? Until that day comes, we have to keep pressing on. We have to keep looking at this word to better understand so that we do not succumb to what I think a lot of people have ignorantly come to. God's done with these people. Mm -mm. That's like saying, he's done with you. Would you like if I said that? Because he's not done with you and he's not done with me. And we are children of the kingdom. And he's still working on me. And he's still working on you. So I'd say, if he is that great potter, that great artist, he's capable of taking lumps that are ugly, unsightly, that seemingly have no purpose, put them on his wheel, mold them, and fashion them into what he will call vessels of honor in eternity. Until then, we'll keep investigating what the Apostle Paul has to say and sort it out so that we can at least say we know how the story ends. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.